Well, Chi Xiang is going to read now the next part of our series uh, in Acts. So if you can grab a Bible, uh, he's going to be reading from Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 18 to 28. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sancria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he, he promised, I will come back if, it's, if it is the will, if it is God's will. Then he set sail for, from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to to their home, and explain to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos went, wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great, he, he was a great help to those who, who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that J- Jesus was the Messiah. So let's pray as we turn uh, to look at Acts 18 together. Father God, thank you that you do speak. You speak truth into our lives. A truth about what it means to be your people, to be the church, to, to live in the light of the cross, yes, and to live in the light of the resurrection and ascension. So Lord, help us to hear that today, so that we might be those who are transformed by that truth and who in turn speak with great spiritual fervor of the things we've seen and heard. Amen. Well, uh, we're in this series in the book of Acts, uh, and we're going to be in it for the next three months. Uh, And one of the things you see as you work through the book of Acts is that the early church, the church in the first century, was undoubtedly a missional church church. Acts starts with an audacious global vision for the church. Just before he ascends, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, The early church was a church on mission, a a sent church, sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ to be his witnesses. That is what it means to be missional. It, It means to go out, to be sent, and to speak of Jesus. It won't be easy. As we read the book of Acts, we see it's not easy. The disciples, as they're sent out, they get mocked. They get flogged, they get imprisoned, that they even get killed for their testimony. But we see that that is what disciples of Jesus are called on to do, to be people on mission. It's been almost nine years uh, since City Church started. It started right here on the 7th of September 2014, just a little group down in the corner in kind of the middle here. But that's how it started. And when we started, we were determined to be a church that was focused on those outside of the church. Because, you know, churches 
Churches are not intended to be like tennis clubs. Tennis clubs focus all of their efforts, all of their resources on serving their members, those on the inside. Churches are the opposite. We must focus our effort, our resources, our energy on those outside the church, inviting them to come in and meet Christ. That's why our vision when we started City Church was to reach the city, build people up, and then send them out to reach Manchester, the Northwest, and beyond with the good news of Jesus. That's what we're about as a church. That was our version of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We wanted to be a missional church. And what I'd like to do with you today is focus on three features of a missional church that we find here in the second half of Acts chapter 18. We're going to look at at three snapshots, three pictures of what city church might be like for you if we're a missional church. First up, are you ready for this? First up, it means we will be like an airport terminal where people are always coming and going. That's verses 18 to 23 of Acts 18. Remember what we saw last Sunday as Matt took us through the first 17 verses. Paul had left Athens and he traveled 50 miles west to the city of Corinth. And there he met this couple, Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, they were new arrivals in the city of Corinth too. They'd been forced to to flee Rome when Emperor Claudius gave an imperial edict telling all the Jews to leave. That's verse 2 of chapter 18. Now, in Corinth, Paul and his new friends, they saw incredible fruit, incredible fruit as they shared the gospel. So much so that they set up a new meeting place next door to the synagogue at Titius Justice's house, that's verse 7 of chapter 18, and loads of people were getting saved as they came to this house and heard the good news of Jesus. Even, even the synagogue leader himself put his trust in Jesus. But with that fruit came opposition. And so, like we saw last week, God strengthened Paul in a nighttime vision, that's verse 9, which convinced Paul to stay put in Corinth and to keep on preaching the gospel. And the result? Well, a church was formed. And Paul remained in the city for at least two years. But then, verse 18, he leaves Corinth, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. Now, first they head to Kenkre, that was the eastern seaport of Corinth. And from there, they set sail to Ephesus, just across the Aegean Sea. Now, Ephesus, Ephesus was the capital of Asia Minor. It was, it was a big commercial center. It was a place where everyone came to, and it was full of Jewish people as well, which meant that when Paul arrived as a Jew, he immediately went to the synagogue, verse 19, and began reasoning or debating there. It seems that there were already the, the embryonic beginnings of a church in the city of Ephesus. We'll, we'll hear more about that next week. And the Christians beg Paul to stay, verse 20. But he departs, leaving Priscilla and Aquila behind. You see, Paul was on mission. He he sent, he sent out by the Lord. And so verse 21, he promises that he will return, but big qualification... Only if the Lord wills. You see, it was God who dictated Paul's itinerary, not Paul. From Ephesus, Paul set sail to Caesarea on the coast of Judea. That was more than 650 miles from Ephesus. That would have meant spending a month at sea. And from there, he heads south to the church in Jerusalem, probably to celebrate the Passover festival. And then he heads north for 500 miles to Antioch. Now, Antioch was likely Paul's intended destination. Because remember, back in verse 18, we're told that he was sailing to Syria. 
And Antioch was the first place he gets to in Syria. According to verse 23, Paul spends some time in Antioch. But, but, it seems his intention in Antioch was simply to be there to to, to restock, to, to replenish, to refresh himself. And then having done that, he heads northwards and westwards to Galatia and Phrygia to strengthen the Christians there. You see, if you were back with us when we looked at Acts chapter 13, we saw about the church in Antioch. Back there in Acts chapter 13, we saw that the church in Antioch was made up of a a multi-ethnic, multicultural leadership who spent their time worshipping the Lord, fasting and praying, and then sending out their people to go and take the gospel of Jesus to other nations. They were a missional church, a sending church. Now, that's a very quick gallop through the geography of this chapter. What do you notice? What struck you? Well, surely it's the constant coming and going throughout verses 18 to 23. It was the experience of the church in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Jerusalem, and in Antioch. And it's almost disorientating, isn't it? You you read that and your head starts spinning. You feel dizzy. But you know, that is what a missional church is like. That is what life in a missional church is like. It's an airport terminal with people constantly coming and going, being refilled, equipped, and then sent out to their destination. That is what mission involves. And you know, that is what life at City Church is like. If you've been at City Church from the beginning, like I have, you will have seen almost a thousand people come to City Church and then leave. A thousand. And that's hard. It is hard feeling like you've watched your friends leave and being here on a Sunday feeling like you only know probably half the people who are here. That's difficult. You know, being in a global city like Corinth or Ephesus or Antioch, we're just like that in Manchester. We are a global city. And that means that it's inevitable that some of you will be asked to leave Manchester in the coming years. It it might be that your work asks you to move down to their office in London. It it might be that your fiancé says, oh, please come and live here where I am rather than me having to move to Manchester. It, It might be your parents who ask you to move closer to where you grew up. Now, I really hope that some of you will decide to say no. For the sake of the gospel, to to decide to stay here in Manchester because of the need, because less than 1% of the people here are going to a gospel church. I hope some of you will stay, accepting that that will mean a lower salary, not seeing your friends and family so much. I know how costly that decision is. But that won't be what everyone chooses to do, and nor should it be. Many of you will leave Manchester in the next five years. And here's the thing. That's okay. In fact, it is good. Because when you go, you go as missionaries, sent out people. You know, Priscilla and Aquila didn't go to Corinth primarily for gospel reasons. They, they went because they got kicked out by Empress Claudius. But God had different reasons for them leaving Rome. He sent them to Corinth to be missionaries. And you know, the same, the same was true for Josh and Janelle Alfred, who left to go to Winchester for work 
Barbara, who last year moved to Washington, D.C. to be closer to family. Emma Pinney, who moved to Belfast to be with her new husband. They went as missionaries. As a church, as a missional church, we will always have people coming and going. We've just seen the video of the making team who are going to be coming over in a couple of weeks' time. That will be a great blessing to us. Two weeks ago, we had an offer accepted on a city centre flat, which is going to be used to, to house senior saints from the United States of America who are going to come over for several weeks or several months to, to be alongside us, to learn from us and to encourage us, and who we will then send back with the lessons learned here in Manchester to be missionaries back in the United States. That will be hard for us. It will be hard for them emotionally and relationally. But friends, that is what a missional church is all about. We're an airport terminal with people constantly coming and going, not a graveyard where people lie at rest. You know, I think many of us hunger for stability. I know I do. I know I do. We long for things to stay just as they are. It pains us when we send out 32 of our friends to start a church up in Prestwich like we did three years ago. It's hard. We wish our friends didn't leave Manchester and move south. We wish that we could have some stability and continuity. And that is right. It is right to to long for that. It is right to long for stability. That is good. That is a right desire. But it is not for now. Not yet. Because if we're on mission, it will mean constant coming and going. Sending and being sent. A missional church is an airport terminal, not a graveyard. Secondly, a missional church is a school where the humble will learn. Uh, Take a look at verses 24 to 26. Uh, A man named Apollos arrives in Ephesus. Now, we're told that Apollos was from Alexandria. Alexandria was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Located in North Africa, it was famed for its great museum and its incredible library that had more than 400,000 volumes in it. The Old Testament was translated into Greek in Alexandria, and Alexandria in the first century was home to Philo, the great Jewish philosopher. Alexandria was the, the intellectual and the cultural capital of the ancient Near East. It was the kind of Oxford, Cambridge of the ancient world. And that is where Apollos came from. And verse 24 fits that. We're told that Apollos was a learned man. He knew his Bible back to front. He had his memory verses locked in, able to recall in an instance. And he'd been told about the way of Jesus too. In fact, verse 25, he spoke about it with great spiritual fervor. That means that he was stirred up emotionally in spirit. For Apollos, it wasn't simply head knowledge that he had. He had both head and heart knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew what it was to have a life transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And that enabled him, verse 25, to teach accurately and verse 26 to teach boldly. But there was something off with his theology. Verse 25, he knew only the baptism of John. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, except that despite his elite education, something was missing in his knowledge of Jesus. And so after he's finished speaking in the synagogue, giving this this articulate, incredible speech, Priscilla and Aquila take him to one side and they say, well, thank you so much, Apollos, for what you just shared. It was was really, really helpful. Thank you. Really interesting. I wonder, I wonder, would would you come home with us? Maybe come back for dinner 
And then after dinner, we're going to explain to you all that you said that was wrong and help you to understand how to say it rightly next time. How would you respond if that happened to you? I suspect most of us, uh, we do that thing where we put on the polite smile while we're seething inside the insult. Just think about who this couple were. First up, notice how Priscilla comes before Aquila throughout this passage. That probably indicates that Priscilla was the the more prominent and influential person in the church. So in a man's world, a woman, Priscilla, was seeking to point out to a man, Apollos, what he got wrong. Secondly, notice their profession. Uh, Back in verse 3, we're told that Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers. That doesn't mean they worked and go outdoors, okay? They were manual laborers. Tents back then, they weren't made of canvas. They were made of thick, heavy, smelly leather. Priscilla and Aquila, they would have had their hands permanently dyed brown because night and day, they were handling leather tents. It was a stinky job. They were rough people. So, rough manual laborers were pointing out an error by a professional, an elite. Because thirdly, Apollos was also highly educated. He was the best of the best. And yet here, he's being corrected by a couple who probably didn't have a GCSE between them. How would you have responded? How would I have responded? Badly, I fear. Because criticism is really hard to take, isn't it? Especially when it comes from people who we consider to be less qualified. Why? Why do we find it so hard to be corrected? Well, I found a talk by Michael Keller really helpful here. And he points out that the reason we find criticism so difficult is because we seek to find our identity in what we do and what we know. Our society encourages us to do that, doesn't it? We're told from the earliest age that we need to to go to a good school and get the best possible education, because if we do, that knowledge will build a platform for us to do the sort of job where people will respect us. And so when someone points out that what we've done is wrong, Or or when someone points out that we lack knowledge in some way, we we naturally go on the defensive, especially if the feedback comes from someone who we regard as being beneath us. Why? Why do we act that way? Well, because we receive the feedback as if it's an attack on us. And of course, it it is an attack on us from our perspective because we have located our identity in what we know and what we do. It's our fault. It's our fault. You know, Apollos didn't respond that way. Why? Well, it must have been because whatever thoughts he had in his understanding of the gospel. He knew enough of the gospel to grasp that his identity was found in Jesus. He knew that he was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that knowledge, that identity, knowing that he was freely forgiven by God, knowing that when God looks at him, he says, I love you, you are in the right with me, that knowledge enabled Apollos to humbly receive feedback, to humbly learn from people who, culturally speaking, were beneath him. What about you? When you come here to church on a Sunday, who do you expect to learn from? Who will you let teach you? 
Only those older than you? Those who've been a Christian longer than you? Those of a similar social class or ethnic background? Or will you be willing to learn from anyone and everyone? A couple of weeks ago, I was um, teaching on complementarianism. And we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we saw that only men should be appointed to the authoritative teaching role of elder within a local church. But as I was showing that from the passage, I was careful. I was very, very careful to say that women do have a teaching role in the church. You know that, don't you? Listen, if you've come here today as a young man and you think, I'm just going to keep my distance from the women here. I've got nothing to learn from them. I'm just going to stick around with the guys, especially the guys who are older and more mature than me. Can I say, and I want to say this to you lovingly, that is nothing other than pride. And even more worrying, perhaps it means that you haven't yet got the gospel. We need each other. Our men need our women. Our marrieds need our singles. Our doctors need our job seekers. Our Brits need our Iranians. Our Brazilians need our Nigerians. Our young need our old and vice versa. A missional church. A church where its members have had their identity radically changed by the gospel. It is a school where the humble learn. And finally, it is an open house where you are the chef. Uh, Just look with me back at the verses that Matt took us through last week. Uh, Verses 2 and 3. When Paul arrives in Corinth, he's taken in by Priscilla and Aquila. Now, the three of them, they live together, they eat together, they work together, they do life together. That means a married couple sharing life with a single man. A couple of Europeans with an Asian. Now, at this stage, Paul was an older believer. So I suspect that as they ate, as they socialized, as they worked together, Paul intentionally discipled them. As he describes it in his first letter to the church in Thessalonica, he sought not just to share the gospel with people, but his life as well. This was life-on-life discipleship. The gospel displayed not simply in words, but in action, in life, in care and love. And having discipled Priscilla and Aquila in their home in Corinth, Paul takes them with him when he goes to Ephesus. You see, his discipleship wasn't simply helping them to be more mature Christians. No, it was with a view to them joining him on mission. But then having taken them to Ephesus, he leaves them in Ephesus. Which means, verse 24, when Apollos arrives in the city, they do for Apollos what Paul had done for them. They disciple him. They welcome him into their home, share the gospel with him, and share their lives too. And the result, verse 27, Apollos himself is sent out to Achaia, in modern-day Greece, where he was a great help to those who by grace have believed. Do you see the pattern? Life in a missional church will be an airport terminal, people constantly coming and going. And that's a good thing. But at the same time, it will be an open house where we welcome people in and share not just the gospel, but our lives as well with them. And that is for everyone. People are discipled and then they disciple other people. We are welcomed in and then we welcome in others. And that's for everyone. It's it's not just for the pastors. It's not just for the more mature Christians. It's not just for the people with bigger and nicer houses. It's for everyone. We've got some excellent examples of that here at City Church. I think of Paul and Chloe Retty, who opened up their house to everyone for the coronation weekend. I think of those of you who regularly take in lodgers for months at a time. 
from church. I think of those of you I know who are meeting up weekly with one or two people to read the Bible with them, to pray with them, to disciple them. There are lots of people here at City Church asking to be discipled. They are. That's great. And we're looking to put in place systems to help us to disciple more and more people. But what you need to know, if you're a Christian, is that you must disciple others too. Not not simply be discipled yourself. A missional church, it is an open house where you are the chef. Not just serving up good food physically in your home, but serving up good food spiritually for younger believers. Maybe you're sat there and you think, well, I hear that, but I just don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know my Bible as well as other people here at City Church. I'm just not that type to do discipleship. Well, I suspect Priscilla and Aquila would have been tempted to say exactly the same thing. But having been discipled by Paul, having been fed spiritually by him, they themselves become spiritual chefs. What about you? If you're a Christian here, you have received the gospel. How are you going to serve up the gospel to someone else? So that's what a missional church looks like. It's an airport terminal where people are constantly coming and going. It's a school where the humble learn and an open house where you are the chef. Friends, that is hard What we're describing here is not a comfortable house in the country where no one ever comes to bother you. No, it's an ever-changing place. And it means sharing your life with others all the time. How are you going to live like that? Well, we need to look to our saviour. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 21. He said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? What we experience as missional people is what God himself has experienced as the missional God. The Father knows what it's like to send out the one he loves. And the Son knows what it's like to leave the place he loves and feels secure in. They know that sort of sacrifice. And Jesus knows what it's like to humbly learn. I mean, the scriptures themselves tell us that Jesus himself was the very word of God. That's what John chapter 1 tells us. He's the Bible in a person. And yet, and yet, how did Jesus most likely learn those very words. Well, surely it was from his teenage mother as she read the Bible to him each night before he went to bed. And God's home, heaven, you know it's the ultimate open house. He welcomes you in this afternoon. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, we don't deserve to come in. Having rebelled against him, we deserve to come to that house and find a door shut in our face. But God has opened that door to you today. He's opened it for you. Having given us the spiritual bread from heaven, his own son lifted up on the cross, dying in our place for our sins, he now says, come, feast, share my life. God's astonishing hospitality. His opening of his home, his opening of his life for us which empowers us in turn to open up our lives to others as we point them to Jesus. Let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the ultimate example of hospitality. You emptied your house of your son so that your house might be filled with your people. Lord Jesus, you were broken as the bread of heaven so that we might be made whole. You were poured out on the cross so that we might drink in eternal life itself. Help us to live as your sent people, serving the sending God in proclaiming the glorious good news that you, Lord, have opened up your house for all who would come and made it possible through your Son's full and final death for us. Amen.